Good afternoon. My name is um, Doug Mahoney. I'm editor-in-chief at uh, Vaughn Magazine. I'm here to talk about TV white spaces, um, what might be the next Wi-Fi. Um, let me give you a 30-second intro about who I am. Um, I've been a contributor to Mobile Radio Technology Magazine since January of 2003. Um, I've been hearing policy wonks talk about um, the use of 700 megahertz um, spectrum, um, basically the, all that um, TV spectrum, and I'm going to get a little bit more into um, the freed up TV spectrum that's coming, um, um, and as well as the use of unlicensed spectrum. Um, talk about this stuff in DC for years. Um, and my day job is uh, editor in chief at Vaughn Magazine. We did an interview with uh, Phil Zimmerman in early 2007. I guess Phil liked it so much he um, put the interview on the uh, cover of his website, so I guess we did something right. Okay. And what would you suggest? 640 by 480? Yes, no. All right, let's see. One twenty four by seven sixty eight, yes? All right, let's go ahead and apply. Yeah, okay. Let's hit OK. Yes, okay, I got the yes part right. All right, now let's try this again. And view. Apply to. Okay, we more better here? Okay. And it took longer than King Tuna did, too. Okay. Unlicensed TV white spaces. Um, I'm going to talk about what what it, the definition of white spaces is, um, how did the concept got created, uh, the technical proposals surrounding white TV white spaces, um, talk about the FCC findings were, which were released just this week, um, and then a little bit as to what's going to happen in terms of um, final word on this, is, which is expected in October. Um, first of all, what's white spaces? Um, the current U.S. analog or NTSC television system uses VHF and UHF frequencies. So today on your TV dial, should you be one of the five people in the U.S. that don't have cable or satellite, um, you've got TV channels 2 through 69 on your dial. Um, as of February 18, 2009, assuming there's no last-minute political plan panic, and you know I'm not willing to bet against that, it's a long shot, but... Um, Channels two through fifty-one will be for digital, will be for TV, and it's all digital. Okay, let's take a step back here. Um, in any given geographic area, as you know, if you are one of those five people that that has a broadcast that's still getting TV through the airwaves, um, you can receive a handful of stations um, due to the basics of um, geography, i.e., where you're located, and careful licensing. Um, you know, they don't. You know, if you've got. Um, you know, you don't have a TV station per channel from channels two all the way up through 51. They, they, um, once you go up higher on the um, scale, um, they tend to leave spaces between TV stations, so there's no interference there. Um, and then in smaller markets, you know, you just can't support. You know, if you're in Podunk, you can't support three TV stations. You're lucky to support one TV station. Um, so with 51 channels, less of a handful, and I'll get into what a less of a handful is. Um, You've got lots of open, unused, what they call white spaces channels, because there's no TV, there's no TV broadcast, there's there's no use of the of the, the TV channel at six megahertz of bandwidth, because there's no TV signal to receive. Now, um, each uh, digital TV channel um, is got a six megahertz um, chunk of bandwidth. Um, and again, if I apologize if I I say something wrong, because I'm not a ham operator, and I know somewhere along the lines I'm going to step on something, and the ham people are going to chew me out. So. Apologize in advance, um, but you got six megahertz channel, and you got, and within that six megahertz channel, using the existing um, DTV spec created back in God, I don't know, the dark ages of 1980, um, you got 27 megahertz of broadcast bandwidth um, that you can uh, um, data that you can cram into there right now using the existing DTV specs. Um, sidebar there is that some um, TV stations. Um, are using um, a part of their digital TV spectrum to broadcast or data cast um, uh, digital information, but um, not digital information, data, rather than um, 
uh, TV programming, um, but it varies from place to place and it hasn't caught on a lot. All right, um, sidewalks. Uh, well, when the folks decide, when the Congress finally cut this grand bargain or grand satanic deal with um, the National Association of Broadcasters to move from analog TV over to digital TV, um, all of a sudden a lot of people started looking at um, moving people out, moving um, TV stations out of um, their existing channels and moving them down and said, hey, well, we're going to have all this free spectrum, we got to do something with it. Um, you heard, so there's been three major fights over this spectrum, um, one of which I'm specifically going to get in today, but I want to touch in on the other two because a couple of you in the audience have asked about, you know, what's going on here. Um, the first type of um, fight that was just um, publicly discussed or got the most coverage um, this week was um, the rules for the spectrum auctions um, for 700 megahertz. Um, there's a second spectrum auction coming up um, for that chunk of, um, for, for chunks of sp spectrum between um, 52 through 69 and um, Google basically wanted to set a niche neutrality set of rules um, on how the spectrum was going to be used um, as you would expect the incumbent vendors as well as the uh, and the incumbent vendors, i.e. the um, cellular companies, people who own the cellular company said, well, we don't really want to do that. What happened was a compromise um, uh, put through in the FCC where they said, well, okay, you're going to have to have um, open devices if you uh, get rights to this spectrum. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that works out because um, this is a Carter phone-like decision where you're going to be able to, if, if let's say a Verizon or a Sprint, um, well, let me rephrase that, a Verizon or an AT&T gets use of the 700 megahertz spectrum, you're going to be able to buy any device and use it with their service or are there going to be more strings attached? Nobody knows. Um, in theory, you should be able to bring your own device just like you'll be able to take your own um, telephone now and plug it into the PSTN, but don't know. Um, second um, uh, uh, war has been over public safety. Public safety, um, especially after 9-11, um, wants 700 megahertz spectrum for an interoperable broadband network. Um, there were some uh, uh, rules that the FCC set that a part of the spectrum that will be auctioned off um, is going to be dedicated to um, some sort of public-private partnership um, to build out a broadband network for public safety um, across the United States. How, what that looks like, who knows? They got to get the bids. They got to negotiate all that stuff. And then the third thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, TV white spaces. Um, before we get into that, why is 700 megahertz RF band? Why is it loved and coveted by all? Um, well, the first obvious fact is that hey, it's all this this chunk of big free spectrum, and um, but not only that, the propagation characteristics are great um, because it goes through wall, walls, obstacles relatively easily. Um, and then uh, in a licensed use mode, you can cover a city with either one or two base stations um, versus lots of cells or transmitter sites when you're using Wi-Fi and higher frequencies. Um, when you, I, I saw one slide um, presented a couple of years ago that showed 700 megahertz overlay network on a, on a typical city like Seattle versus a WiMAX type of network in 2.5 gigahertz and there's like one base station in the center of town with um, 700 megahertz and when you got into WiMAX it was like you know, uh, eight, nine, ten base stations um, just to cover the same territory. So um, it's uh, pretty powerful um, stuff. Um, more importantly, um, there's a lot of white spaces available the farther away from cities you go. Um, you know, if we were to take a ride out in, um, and, and make a couple, you know, go out, ride out in the desert and make a couple of turns, um, assuming we could find a uh, place to plug in a TV, um, it's very quiet out there, uh, uh, electronically speaking. So policy wonks see this opening up of white spaces um, and 700 megahertz as a savior for the digital vibe in, in rural America. They want more broadband, but carriers don't want to invest in infrastructure, i.e. copper fiber or whatever, to go out to Podunk. So a lot of rural senators are saying, well, broadband can get us to, um, oh, excuse me, RF can get, get us to broadband without having to, to deal with expensive infrastructure. Another FYI, there's a lot of um, lurking licensed 700 megahertz space um, that's already been bought. The first auction um, was um, conducted several years ago and there's a bunch of speculators sitting on it. Um, the two largest are Aloha Networks 
and um, Vulcan Ventures. Does anybody know who Vulcan Ventures is? Uh, well, um, I don't even call Paul Allen the guy from Apple. I think he's a guy from Microsoft, but yeah, Paul Allen Vulcan Ventures has got like the second biggest chunk of 700 meg megahertz, biggest chunk of licenses, um, aside from this one man band called Aloha Networks. Um, Aloha, as another aside, Aloha owns some 700 megahertz spectrum in Las Vegas, and they've talked about doing a demo um, um, of um, their system. Um, and then Qualcomm, I think, um, I'm, Nationwide, they have the equivalent of Channel TV 59 locked up. So if you're um, talking about mobile TV, um, you guys may have seen Verizon where you can walk around and watch your mobile TV in our Verizon phone. Um, that's Qualcomm stuff, and that's, their, uh, that's, uh, that's what was Channel 59. Um, the second auction is coming up, as I noted. Um, and out of this, there's speculation that cable companies, Google or others, may raise enough money to go bid on these licenses. Um, and obviously, as I said before, there's a lot of infighting on how the, the auction should be um, conducted. Google has pushed for liberalized auction rules and the CTIA, i.e. the sell guys and the incumbent carriers like the way things are currently worked. Okay. So how did this concept of white spaces um, um, get created? Um, you know, why is this a good thing for America? Um, what happened was as um, the na as, as p policymakers started looking at um, the need for more spectrum, for more bandwidth, for more uses, seeing with the success of Wi-Fi, um, they said, well, okay, what else can we do? And they, they looked at the fact that the broadcast TV was moving out of 700 megahertz, and they started thinking a little bit, well, and, and thinking about, well, there's all this, there's all this extra bandwidth because um, because with TV, you know, with the way TV broadcast licenses are set up, you're not putting TV channels back to back. You're licensing TV stations where there's one or two or three or four within a um, within a geographic region, and then there's all these empty um, there's all these empty channels that are available for broadcast. Um, and then again, there's, there's recognition for demand for more more unlicensed bandwidth um, because there's a belief that if we have more unlicensed stuff. It'll stimulate the um, uh, use of consumer devices, um, blah, 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 sell more g g widgets, we're all good. One of the other things that the policy wonks brought to the table is the concept of the cognitive or smart radio as an enabling technology to be able to find um, unused TV bandwidth and uh, utilize it. And, and DARPA had done a lot of work, has done a lot of work on um, what they call cognitive radio. This is a recent history of, of where white spaces is um, in terms of the, the legal machinations. Um, the FCC notice there went out on May uh, 2004. Um, whatever licensing is done for uh, TV white spaces, it won't be a part 15 Wi-Fi type. It'll be something a bit different. Um, first round of comments have come back on the FCC notice saying, hey, we're, gonna, we're talking about unlicensed use for TV white spaces. What do you think? And then you had about uh, three major parties commenting in. Uh, the White Spaces Alliance, I'll get into who they are in a minute. Motorola's commented on it. Um, and then the Association for Maximum Service Television, which is basically a front for NAB, I think, best way to put them. Um, and then FCC um, addressed the comments uh, July 31st, that is uh, this last Tuesday. FCC notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, it was written in part by a guy by the name of Ed Thomas, um, who was who was uh, head of um, the Office of Engineering and Technology? Remember this name; it will come up again. Um, the statement basically said that the FCC wanted to open up the white spaces channels, open up a dialogue between industry, in other words, you know, here the NAB bitch, and um, as well as um, technology companies. So they wanted to get the ball rolling and get everybody talking about how people could use this um, bandwidth, uh, this excuse me, this um, spectrum. And then the, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking threw out three suggested approaches to avoid interference with existing TV stations. Because if you're going to have an unlicensed wireless device, one of the key principles is an unlicensed device shouldn't interfere with a licensed device. Um, so the three su suggested propose propo approaches in the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking by the FCC was, number one, use a guard signal to tell a, a device that 
hey, okay, these are the available channels in this region, use everything else, that was one approach. Second approach was geolocation, in other words, um, build enough smarts into the device to go, where am I at? Okay, I'm sitting in Las Vegas, so let me go out to the FCC database and go look at where um, the broadcast signals are, um, which uh, TV channels are out here, and then I can, from that I can calculate where my open spaces are. Or third, the smartest approach and probably the most intelligent approach um, is spectrum sensing, where you look at um, you look at the RF environment around you and you sense it, you basically smell it and you go, aha, okay, I've got TV channels 2, 4, and 5 going on here and i got some um, other stuff going on, on this, in this frequency from wireless microphone use, so I'm going to block those things out and I can use everything else. Now, the National Association of Broadcasters um, was not happy um, when it comes to preserving the sanctity of um, um, the airwaves and you know for all again for all five of those people who get broadcast TV um, they get really huffy um, so they generated a worst case scenario for white space is basically saying if you plug into these devices digital TV is going to go to crap um, and they, they try to convince the FCC that it would never work and they sent out like 154 pages going well it won't work because here blah 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 and this is even before anybody's put together a prototype device it's saying it's not going to work um, now, white space devices um, from the discussion won't be part 15 Wi-Fi, and again, this is where the um, the hams can go and come up and smack me afterwards. Um, you know, part 15, I think they say up to one watt of power, and you basically principle are you must take interference from other devices, and you must not cause interference with other devices. Um, so basically, you're screwed both ways. You can't hurt anybody, and not only can you hurt any, you can't, you can't interfere with anybody. But you know, if the, the other, if the microwave turns on next door, you got to take it. You, there's no way around it. Um, comments from the White Spaces Alliance and Motorola indicate that the, the model for Part 15 um, Wi-Fi type of uses was not work, work, bleh, workable because the typical white space device is going to be um, broadcasting at under one watt and exactly how much under one watt is, I think, up to discussion. But basically under one watt to avoid interference with other operating TV channels. And number two is that you're going to need a cognitive or smart radio to avoid intentional interference. Um, and then the, the, this, the approach is favored by both Motorola and the White Spaces Alliance were a look before broadcast approach um, and or geolocation. Um, let's talk a little bit about cognitive or smart, smart radio. This is another concept that's going to come back um, and get discussed in future years, and hopefully at DEF CON 16, 17, 18, and 19, um, we'll actually see some of these devices. Um, a smart radio, a cognitive radio, um, the terms are sometimes get interchangeable depending upon which policy wonk you're talking to, um, but basically smart radio should be able to sense the RF environment around you, um, um, be able to, after it's profiled the um, RF environment, it should be able to avoid broadcasting on, in this case, television channels in use. Um, should be able to find the unused bandwidth and adjust its power accordingly so it doesn't stomp on any, any broadcasting. Like if there's a wireless mic next door, maybe you don't want to use something on an adjacent channel at, at, at power. Um, when you start talking about um, cognitive um, white radio, um, it, starts, it sounds like a lot like electronic warfare without the war. In other words, you're taking a, a, an RF snapshot of the environment or sensing what your RF environment is around you, um, but you're not trying to figure out how to jam every, anything. In this case, you're trying to figure out how not to jam um, devices. Um, the other principle to take away is that um, the, the poster child for cognitive radio right now um, and consumer devices is for TV white spaces, but there's consideration to use another, like what I call junk bands. White Spaces Alliance comments. Okay, um, here's where we get back to you. Remember what I asked, sent earlier? Um, White Spaces Alliance is made up basically of a lot of high-tech heavy hitters. You've got Dell, Google, HP, Intel, Microsoft, and Philips. Um, Google is very interesting because not only have they been pushing for um, 700 megahertz usage, um, and said they actually go bid on licensed spectrum. Not only do they want to do things with licensed spectrum, Google wants to do stuff with unlicensed spectrum. Um, so they're pretty key there. Um, the, one of the contributors that helped put together the, um, an initial package of information to respond to the FCC comments was a guy by the name of Ed Thomas. Well, he used to work for the FCC. Now he's working for a law firm down on K Street. So um, it's interesting to see how that revolving door is working. Um, the White Spaces Alliance people said, look, here's what we propose to do. 
We're going to block off channels 2 through 20 on the, on the TV dial, as well as channel 37 for um, radio telescope usage. Anyways, um, because we want to avoid interference with existing licensed users, um, i.e. the land mobile radio people um, and the wireless mic people. Um, but we'd also like to propose that we reserve the lower end of channels um, uh, 2 through 20 the higher end of 2 through 20, for potential public safety white spaces usage. Um, there's a feeling that if, if, there's a white, if you produce a white spaces device, broadband type of device, that's like a Wi-Fi device that's in channels 21 through, um, uses 21 through 69, then, or f excuse me, 21 through 52, then, hmm, if I add on a, if I tweak this model a little bit, I can tap into some of these other channels and in cases where things are available, public safety can use some of those lower channels to build their to build an ad hoc, ad hoc broadband network. Um, White Spaces Alliance said geolocation is too cumbersome. They start complaining about um, who would update the database of, of um, emitters, how do you get the device to log in to check emitters, how often is that updated. They, they go through all these reasons why geolocation is too cumbersome. They don't even talk about the guard channel concept about using a, a, a broadcast channel that would uh, separate FM type of broadcast channel to tell you um, what um, uh, white spaces are available in your region. That forget it. That's just adds more part count cost. It's more parts, more expensive, more complicated device. Um, so they said, "Hey, spectrum centering. There, there's smart radio is the only way to go." And oh, by the way, here's this device that Microsoft built. Pong. This is a toy that Microsoft built. <laughs> I'm probably going to regret saying toy because. We may, it might be hmm. something else. But basically, what you see here is you got a laptop running um, uh, Windows XP. Probably the revi version 2.0 will be running under Windows Vista, no doubt. Um, and it's got three black boxes. One of them is a transmitter. Actually, what do I say? Okay. Um, Microsoft called this, as usual, with their marketing, with their high quality marketing savvy. Microsoft White Spaces TV Development Platform Version 1. Um, when the press release first came out um, earlier this year about it, um, the few press people that picked this up made it sound like a finished consumer device. This is not a finished consumer device. Microsoft basically provided a, a prototyping platform to allow the FCC to play around with and evaluate um, the, the ability of a device to find open, open TV white spaces um, on existing radio spectrum. Um, and then also as a development kit for manufacturers um, to build like um, to build products that are Wi-Fi like in nature, if I can say that. Um, the, why did White Spaces give the FCC the device? Um, the FCC test division um, is able to, to take this device and go um, um, play with the knobs on it. Basically, it tends to the sensitivity of the 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 technology that's being presented, um, be able to turn some of the knobs and software on it, see what happens if you turn on more power, does that interfere with, uh, with reception of digital TV, turn it down, well, what's the minimum that we can do to, to get a signal in there, um, test interference with existing devices, that's pretty much a good portion of what the FCC's charter is, um, and then also test uh, various waveforms to I identify digital TV signals, NTSC signals, which of course is in some ways uh, moot because after 2000 and February 2009, NTSC goes away as well as wireless mics. And then, um, well, how does this, this thing work? Well, basically, again, it enables developers to create um, um, spectrum scanning, in other words, looking at um, spectrum and figuring out what's being in use, and signal recognition software and hardware. Um, basically to avoid and to coexist and avoid interfering with um, digital TV operators. Um, and then also it's enabled, it, uh, developers get a chance to play around with refining um, power control algorithms, um, waveform mod modulation, and then the, the big key for the FCC is to perform on-air propagation and cover me coverage measurements. So basically the FCC wanted something to play with. Um, the White Spaces Coalition said here, well, let me rephrase. The, the, the White Spaces Corporation publicly said, here, here is this wonderful device from Microsoft for you to work with. Um, 
I know. Using Microsoft and wonderful in the same sentence is kind of an oxymoron, but forgive me. I, you'll, you'll see why I'm saying this so shortly. Under the hood of this, there's two systems assemblies. Again, there's a Windows PC-based box um, using the uh, uh, Internet Explorer browser as an interface. What do you expect from Microsoft? Um, and then there's three boxes. That one of them contains a spectrum scanner and a network processor. Um, and then there's a tunable um, a UHF uh, duplex transceiver in there as well, so they can do broadcast as well. So not broadcasting formalized data, but just showing that you can broadcast and manipulate um, signal strength and things like that. Um, how does this gizmo work? You turn it on and it, and it goes through, scans uh, uh, channels 21 through uh, 51, does a, uh, an FFT, and of course I'm old, so I can't remember what FFT stands for, but basically does math to figure out, okay, what's, you know, what sort of um, uh, fingerprints we have here, and then it matches those uh, fingerprints to the templates it has for um, uh, DTV and uh, NTSC, um, and then, uh, Things that it doesn't find, and if it doesn't find any DTV channels in there, then it goes, okay, this might be a, a chunk of spectrum I can use. Let's go ahead and apply another uh, template in there for see if there's a wireless microphone on 700 megahertz or something else in here. Let's see if, if, if it's really safe to use. Um, and of course, it can all be manipulated through IE. Um, so close the page on that. Um, this is what the the, long, the 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 technology people said. This now Motorola had a different set of comments. Um, Motorola, being a much more conservative company in terms of um, technology, said, "Look, we want to block off channels two through twenty-one on on your TV dial, um, and throw in two other channels for public safety use. Um, whatever devices are used for white spaces, you've got to have geolocation in there, with maybe spectrum sensing in there, maybe later." Um, Spectrum sensing was deemed by Motorola to be too much of an immature technology. I think that's because Motorola hasn't used it that much in terms of, um, hasn't looked at it as, hasn't really looked at it with any passion yet. Um, and there was no discussion again on guard band. Um, when I talked with Motorola and on an interview, I, I was trying to figure out if, if they had sent in a demo device to the FCC or they had a prototype lurking about and they just got, they didn't say yes, they didn't say no, they just got real quiet. Um, that the, the, when the tech wonks came out, there's a think tank called New America down in Washington, D.C., um, and they've been doing a lot, a lot, lot of rah-rah policy, and I encourage you to go um, look up their website. Um, New America has been talking up TV white spaces, um, like I said, for years. Um, what they want to do is take all the TV white spaces, that is everything on the, on the TV dial, and, there's, and they said there's no technical excuse not to look at using that extra spectrum. Um, they said the White Space Coalition, they didn't say they were pussies, but basically it was kind of implied. They said they, they, had, um, they blocked off uh, channels 2 through 20 because they didn't want big antennas. They said White Space Coalition was focused on building portable, i.e. consumer type of devices. And then you turn around they dissed Motorola. They said, well, Motorola is more geared toward fixed broadband devices, so for them geolocation works better. You know, so if you're going to do a canopy or mesh network, that's what you want to do. Now here comes the big news. This just came out on Wednesday. Um, and um, this got lost in the noise about the auction rules about 700 megahertz um, and Google Google wanting bid on spectrum blah blah blah. So um, what came out was that not one company but two companies have submitted prototype devices to the FCC um, talking about two prototype devices for TV white space um, uh, applications. Um, Interestingly, when you read through the FCC report, and this kind of gets glossed over by the White Space Coalition, I'm going to get into that, um, those two devices did not work as well as anticipated. So I want to talk about what, what was good, what was bad, and speculation of failure. Um, like I said, two, two companies uh, supplied devices. The FCC report labels them as prototype A and prototype B. Prototype A has a transmitter included in device. Um, based upon my previous slides, hmm, Microsoft had a transmitter, prototype A. Microsoft's gizmo. Um, and then three copies of this gizmo were provided to the FCC to play with. Um, prototype B, there's one device supplied and had a sensing capability only. The only thing that this little gizmo was, was doing, um, this prototype B, was basically looking at the environment and figuring out um, whether or not there's DTV or NTSC or, or wireless microphones out there. Um, the FCC report very clearly states the devices were not intended for actual consumer products, but they're, they're developmental devices. Basically, you know, they're, they're you know, first-line hacks. Um, 
development tools to evaluate you know, spectrum sensing and whether or not there's going to be any potential interference if you start broadcasting. Um, but these devices were not designed, neither one of the devices submitted was an actual you know, Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi data link type of deal. Okay. Um, the FCC test, they, they did two tests. One of them was for spectrum scanning and one of them was for um, uh, wireless microphone usage. For the bench test, um, they had the devices sense um, or look for um, digital TV channels or broadcasts in the range of um, TV channels 21 through um, 51. Um, the FCC desired requirement was to be able to detect the signal at negative 116 dBm for each six, uh, six megahertz channel. Microsoft wanted 114 dBm. Um, in the field test, they took out the prototype A, i.e. the Microsoft device, at the lab to homes. And this is one of the reasons why working for the FCC might be a cool thing. They get, they, you get the latest stuff and you can take it home and play with it. I don't know. Um, but they, they took the um, uh, Microsoft device out of lab to like homes and, and played around with it in a real world environment to see, you know, kick the tires on it. Now the results for prototype A, Microsoft, um, for the bench test, FCC deemed it reliable to connect, um, to, to connect, to detect digital TV signals at 95 dBm. Okay, remember, the spec is 116. It detects at negative 95, mm, kind of sucks. But more importantly on this, and this is one of the things that um, I'll get into a little bit um, later, but it took 27 seconds per channel and around 13 minutes for a 31 channel range just to go scan through all the spectrum to figure out what's wrong. You know, 30, you know, 13 minutes to boot up and figure out what's out there, you know, it seems to be, you know, it's, yeah, forget it. Um, in the field test, in other words, when they took this thing home, it said 20% of the time, um, only 20% of the time, um, when the NT, when when there was a analog TV um, in use, the device um, tagged the channels as available. Now that's kind of a bullshit result, frankly, because NTSC is going away, and I don't, it, you know. More importantly, is that 45 to 75 percent time, with an average about oh 58 percent, this thing labeled um, TV channels as free when there's actually a digital TV channel going. Um, so basically, you know, it sucked, um, and I found that there were empty channels that were really empty an average of 85 percent of the time, which is not good. Well, it's okay, you know, but again, if if you're only finding empty spaces, there's an extra 15 percent there that you're calling used, but it's empty. Yeah. Prototype B um, was delivered by Philips, and Philips did not issue a press release. Philips did not go through a lot of bullshit about, oh, yes, this is wonderful, this is great. Philips just basically went to the FCC, said, hey, we got this prototype, you know, we do hardware, we're very, you know, we do hardware, this is what we got on breadboard or whatever. Um, the bench test, the Philips device was able to reliably detect um, digital TV signals at negative 115 dBm, exactly what the, um, what the FCC wants in their new specs. So this is very promising. Um, it took about eight seconds for them to scan a channel and about four min minutes for the device to go through the full range of channels and figure out um, what kind of open um, spectrum was available. Um, and then Philip specifically said, and again, I give them props for this, they said, look, don't take this out of the lab. This is not suitable for field testing. Don't do a field test on it. Um, then the FCC also runs some um, tests to, sense, to see if this could sense wireless micro, either device could sense wireless microphones. Uh, prototype A couldn't reliably find wireless microphones. Um, it incorrectly labeled them as DTV channels. In addition to that, when they started doing broadcast testing, um, it turns out that the, the um, transceiver interfered with wireless mics. Um, prototype B had mixed results. So. I called up the White Space Coalition people. They sent out a short press release. They're happy that one device, Philips, um, was able to meet the 116 dBm specs. So they feel like the glass is not half empty, it's half full. Um, and they also want to talk to FCC about the procedures it used to test um, the two prototype devices as well as some other matters. Um, speculation with prototype A, um, in other words, a Microsoft device. Um, according to the, some of the sources I talked to, both devices that were submitted um, first got third-party independent testing conducted beforehand. So either the Microsoft device had a wire loose or something, or B, <clears throat> Microsoft, um, the Microsoft suspicion, uh, submission was not as mature as the developers thought. Okay, pick between A and B. Which one of you think B, you know, which solution do you think? Microsoft? 
Oh. Now, what's expected to be finalized in 2007? Um, FCC testing protocols will be finalized. There's going to be more discussion on this um, um, to make sure everybody's happy. Um, and there's supposed to be a final report and order issued um, for the use of unlicensed TV white spaces in 2007. Real world implementations on this. Well, how's this going to happen? Um, the consumer electronics vendors are hot to go on this. Um, obviously, Philips got a prototype or breadboard device on this, so they're smelling the money. Um, God knows, Intel and Philips always need to sell more chips and devices. Um, I know that everybody's been reading, well, since I have a US centric view of the world, you know, we see a lot of Intel, but, um, you know, Philips and the rest of the world, um, they got all, you know, they got a lot of market share and they got a lot of market share that they need to continue to grow. Um, Google, well, Google wants a, yet another way to get around the man, in this case, um, telcos and cables. And Google, Google obviously wants to look at both, is, is pursuing obviously a multi pronged strategy of both um, looking at unlicensed um, uh, broadcast space for such as in a Wi Fi type of network, as well as licensed um, 700 megahertz um, frequency. Um, and then the software is relatively straightforward, although I'm kind of eating my words on that. Um, I think Microsoft basically did their prototype with one engineer in IE. Um, so hopefully we'll see devices maybe by late 2008 or early 2009 if we don't get into standards. Good. Any questions? And kind of raise your hand. Uh, yes, sir, you front. I, I think the the answer to all that's yes. I mean, once one, okay, he's asking if there's a, a a nexus or if there's some synergies between what's being done with mesh networks and broadcasting of mesh networks and that sort of thing. And the answer is yes. Um, if if we break this down into like, um, yeah, how my seven layer kicks rusty. Um, but basically, if you break this down into net you know networking type of stuff, um, you know applications layer stuff like you know, mesh networks and things like that. Um, you know, you can do whatever you want with a spectrum. So there's going to be a lot. So yeah, I expect, so take a step back. Yeah, I expect people to use the spectrum for things like mesh networking, especially um, with unlicensed use, because as you go out into Podunk, well, not Podunk, but as you go out into rural America, this is like a no-brainer. Um, so, and you know, but on the other hand, well, if you've got a mesh that, well, I don't know. I, the, the short answer is yes. It's just a matter of thinking through the permutations on. Okay, which gives in the political layer, which is beyond applications layer, which is, you know. But it, yeah, I can see where you're going with this. Yeah, there's people are going to look at a lot of different models for this. Other questions? Uh, yes, sir, you over there. I think that this is. I think that's going to be a subject of negotiation as to how the how the how the device handles it. I mean, there may be, you know, if 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 like if you've got a wireless mic on channel, you know, on a channel, it it just may be um, something where you tell the device, look, stay away from, you know, step up or step up or step down from from causing interference um, to avoid it. But I'm not, you know, again, I'm not sure, you know, do you do that? Do you tinker with power? Do you not tinker with power? I mean, there's, I, I, you know, the FCC's um, wonks are going to talk to the white space wonks and, and see what's the best solution there. Okay. Uh, now let me let me spin that. When I say when you say guard channel, or, or probably uh, guard channel is probably an inappropriate term, but but a, a channel that says. The, the initial concept for for, for guard channel or, or um, was you'd have an F, you'd have an FM transmitter within a geographic region 
broadcasting out to a device going, okay, here are here are the here are the devices in this region. Here here are the here are the chunks of spectrum in this region that are in use. Avoid being on those chunks of spectrum. Um, is that yeah? And and the the answer to that is how many minutes I got? You're fine. I was just thinking we could pull it over the QA room so people can hear. Okay, let me finish answering him and then then we can do QA. Um, okay. Oh, he reminds me. All right, let me answer your question and then I got to get into QA. Um, the, 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 it's a nice concept in principle, okay? Great concept in principle, but you got to go find somebody to run the FM station and, and set it up in each geographic region. Okay, there's some cost added on there, okay? You got to go build in that extra code or, or add in that extra chip or that extra part or parts to look for that guard band device. Okay, well that adds an additional cost to my bill of materials. All of a sudden, okay, who pays for the FM um, broadcast guard channel per region, you know, you start going into who, who covers all these costs and, and the business model starts to get a little bit um, complex because you go, who, who pays the bills for this? Because the FCC doesn't want to run guard channel stations. They don't want to do that. Um, and then from, from the manufacturer standpoint, um, you know, they want to crank out millions of these devices so that we can buy them for $150, $200 a pop rather, or lower, hopefully lower, than, you know, they throw in another chip and that's another five bucks there and you know maybe five bucks to the guy who's got to run the FM station I mean it you know uh, they want to stick to the KISS principle and I kind of see where they're coming from so okay um, my friendly uh, my friendly goon has told me that we're going to move the discussion to track one Q&A over there so I need to shut down Mr. Computer um, and then I'm going to take questions over there so I'll see you guys over there shortly